think it's time that we can get started as a few more people take their virtual seats for this first session. Welcome to you all. Welcome to the City of London Green City Briefings. I'm Audrey Tim. I'm technical advisor to the International Association of Horticultural Producers. We are the world's champion for the power of plants. Together with the Worshipful Company of Gardeners, we have put together the series of eight online briefing sessions with the very welcome support of the City of London. As a virtual event, there are only a few technical things that I need to mention. Please make sure that you're on mute and that your video is turned off. We will still know that you are there. There is a set time for questions later and questions will be taken from you, the audience, in writing using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's no shared chat function today, only the Q&A session which you find at the bottom of your screen. I hope that you're all comfortable and are set up with good picture and sound. In deciding on the title for this first session, I wasn't sure whether to call it the city of the future is green or the future of the city is green. Do they have the same meaning, do you think? While you think it over, I will hand you over to Heather Barrett Mould, Master Gardener for the Worshipful Company of Gardeners. Heather will lead you through this first briefing session. Sit back and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks, Audrey. So lovely to see so many people here today. And um, one of the really nice things about these briefings is that we've got people from around the world joining us. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce the first of these eight Green City briefings. They're the result of an excellent partnership between the International Association of Horticultural Producers and the Worshipful Company of Gardeners, with as, with, as Audrey has said, really good support from the City of London Corporation. The briefings aim to present compelling evidence and examples of the power of living green in delivering multiple solutions to city challenges. These briefings will provide some of the latest evidence for the benefits of plants in creating livable, resilient cities and present practical examples of how these benefits are realized. They will include topics such as water attenuation, air quality, heat islands, biodiversity and the quality of life. Today's briefing is The City of the Future is Green, for which we have two eminent speakers. We're fortunate to be able to attract some real expert speakers from across the globe. Not least, I'm honoured to present my Lord Mayor, the Lord Mayor of the City of London, Alderman William Russell, who will open the City of London Green City briefings to share his vision for the city, describing strategies and initiatives that cross multidisciplinary boundaries to have a powerful and influential role in driving and embedding positive change. My Lord Mayor. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us for this Green City Briefing. Uh, thank you to Master Gardener Heather Barrett-Mould and the Worshipful Company of Gardeners for initiating this seminar programme. And thanks to the International Association of Horticultural Producers for collaborating with the Gardeners Company and the City of London to develop and host the series. As a Green Lord Mayor, I am very pleased to be one of your speakers, along with my good colleague, Sir Roger Gifford, a past Green Lord Mayor. In fact, he became uh, greener before I did uh, as chairman of the Green Finance, uh, the G Green Finance Institute. Uh, and this series is a great example of the way the whole community of the city is joining together to find solutions to climate change and to support each other in building a green city. Now, there is a real sense of urgency, commitment and optimism in this crucial year as we look forward to the COP26 being held in this country. We know the scale of the challenge, 
The question we are working together to answer is how to solve it. What is the role of the city in greening finance and financing green? This underpins our program of work as we head along what I call the green brick road to Glasgow. Following on from the Green Horizon Summit, which we held in the city last year here at the Mansion House, which I co-hosted with Mark Carney, we are holding a series of Green Horizons perspectives in the run-up to COP. And alongside the conference itself, we will be running a GHS at COP Summit in both Glasgow and London to showcase what has been achieved and more importantly, to secure commitments to further action. And just as, we are, just as we are calling on all financial institutions to include climate in every decision, so we must at the City Corporation put climate at the heart of all our decision making. This is what we have done with the Climate Action Strategy, which we introduced last year. Our strategy will make the square mile net zero carbon emissions by 2040, 10 years earlier than government goals. And we will reach net zero across our own operations much sooner by 2027. And just to remind everyone, the city has good form in this. In 1953, uh, we, uh, the Clean Air Act, we were the first area in the, in the, in the UK to ban coal fires. Uh, and this climate action strategy involves investing 68 million pounds in fighting climate change over the first six years, creating 800 green jobs. It means revolutionizing the way our planning regulations work so that all new developments include carbon reduction plans. And it means embedding the principles of net zero and climate resilience into all of our operations and projects. To make this a success, our teams are working with partner organizations, environmental consultants, and academic institutions across London and beyond. We are collaborating with other cities and agencies on initi initiatives which cover a range of fields and disciplines. But there is much that we can do right here in our own square mile with our own land. And we have recently had a boost of nine million pounds from the public sector decarbonization scheme to upgrade heating, cooling, lighting, and energy efficiency in our buildings and slash our CO2 emissions by 1500 tons a year. But we need to think beyond buildings as the gardener's company will know better than anyone Gardens and green spaces are a vital part of our environmental resilience and our efforts to become a green city. Now, looking around the square mile, you could be forgiven for not thinking that we are particularly blessed with an abundance of greenery. But in fact, our city gardens team manages more than 170 sites in the square mile, including parks, gardens and churchyards. In more normal times, these are vital places of respite, relaxation and reflection away from the busy hustle and bustle of office life. As Cicero once said, if you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. And by happy chance, I'm speaking at the reopening of the Barbican Library tomorrow, as well as supporting our well-being, gardens and green spaces are also a vital tool in our climate action strategy. And we are going to see them in more and more places, including where we may not have expected to see green in the past. The city's built environment is changing with more greenery on roofs and walls. Recent examples include the rooftop garden at 120 Fenchurch Street, the green tower at 70 Gracechurch Street, and the green wall at 61 Holborn Viaduct, which we believe will be the greenest building in London to date. Last year, there were 42,000 square meters of green roof in the city. Developments currently underway will bring this up to 65,000 square meters. Greening has been proven to improve the thermal performance of both roofs and walls, reducing the need for cooling or heating, and therefore reducing the energy demand, which of course means lower carbon emissions. Green walls and shading from trees also prevent direct sunlight from overheating the inside of a building, therefore reducing the demand for air conditioning, and again, leading to lower emissions. And they have other benefits as well. Green roofs, like green landscapes, retain, retain water during wet weather, therefore reducing the amount of water entering the drainage system and reducing the risk of flooding. Trees help with environmental conditions in windy weather. And crucially, trees and plants improve our air quality. The green city approach, therefore, needs to be to embrace all areas. 
green finance, green buildings, green streets. This all links directly back to our corporate plan for the city, with our central objectives of having a flourishing society, a thriving economy, and an outstanding environment. Having a green city will ensure we have a healthier environment, allow our residents and workers to flourish, and be a place where people want to come and do business, which will drive a thriving economy. A green city will mean a thriving square mile, as well as ensuring we are playing our part to support the transition to net zero. I hope this series will be a call to action for everyone to support the green city agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really, um, it's really lovely to hear you talk about the green spaces in the city. I think people are often surprised when they realise just how much is there. Um, and, um, and actually the, the proposed city plan, which is up for consultation at the moment, um, section 6.6, .6, which is the bit about um, open spaces, is really quite a good read if anybody wants to take that further. So again, thank you so much for doing this. Um, we're fortunate in the City of London to have such leadership in climate action and such champions in both yourself and the Lady Mayoress. Um, I know that you're able to stay for just another 10 minutes, um, but I do want to thank you just now. Um, thanks for opening this series. Thank you, and it's an absolute pleasure, Heather, and well done to the gardeners. Thank you, thank you. So the title of our next presentation is Green Finance, Hype or Hope, which I think is a fabulous title and which I'm looking forward to listening to. As an environmental scientist, I appreciate the need for the financial drive to enable good choices. Um, some of these things you can't do without the financial backing and to make these big changes, you really need um, the finance world helping you. So Roger explores the critical relationship between financial market participants and policymakers in, collaborat in collaborating to co-create solutions. So Roger's career has been in banking in very senior positions internationally. He was chair of the London Green Finance Initiative launched in 2016 and chaired the UK government's Green Finance Task Force in 2000 and 18. So Roger is currently chair of the Green Finance Institute launched in 2019 and was a member of the 2021 Dasgupta review on the economics of biodiversity loss. He was Lord Mayor of London in 2013 and knighted in 2014 for services to international business, culture and the city. So Roger, thank you. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to speak about one of the finance world's latest and most interesting phenomena, green finance. And specifically, my focus at this first green city briefing is on the business city, which directly relates to our main stakeholders without whom our success as a thriving financial center would not exist. I hope to show you that they have a strong interest in this agenda, that they are part of it, not a separate body of people with no real concern. So why are we all so excited about green finance and ESG, environmental, social and governance specific investing? Is it politically contrived or is it just the environment movement finally getting its say? Or is it more? And why especially are we in the UK and the City of London so keen to promote it? We have a truly green global ambassador for financial and related professional services in our current Lord Mayor, as we have heard. I find him very convincing. Yet, is this hype or is it really the hope for the future? Well, it is a movement of hope, desperate hope even, and that is being driven by many people, particularly the investor, or in short, you and me with our pension funds and our investments. Maybe there's been a little bit of hype around it too. Well, even after a year which has been dominated by a pandemic, we can see that the revolution in understanding climate stress continues. And this has not been diminished by COVID-19, 
rather the reverse. As we learn how our unhealthy lifestyles have a higher death rate among asthmatics, the obese, and the generally unfit and unwell. This is tragic for many families. Don't misunderstand me. But it's also been a wake-up call for many of us who value about what, the things we do and how we live, the way we live. Bird song versus motorways, clean air versus speed, and being everywhere we can be almost at the same time. A clear view from the top of Hampstead Heath versus car and bus fumes and the old energy factories in the valleys. Or traveling to New York for lunch by plane and maybe a meeting to help the audit process along rather than taking the call on Zoom or Teams or WebEx. In fact, it feels like this new common green sense is accelerating. And the two-day Green Horizon Summit we hosted in London last year reinforced that. Incredible interest, over 330,000 live stream hits, probably 30 to 40,000 individual separate participants tuning in to hear the latest about green finance. And both last year and this, we are seeing higher green bond issuance than ever before, with a whole range of new labelled bond and fund products coming to market, much of it happening in London. I have never known in my life such a confluence of interest between people, business and governments, or such an intensely exciting period of change in the finance world here in the UK and around the globe. And in many ways, the UK has done well. I think the great smog of 1952 was a real wake up call in recent history. 10,000 people died. It led to the Clean Air Act of 1956 and so on. The Climate Change Act of 2008, net zero commitment in 2019, legally binding. In other ways, we have a way to go. Think gas boilers, which some other countries have almost completely eliminated. In the UK, the phrase we've all heard recently is building back better, which has a strong post-COVID ambition to take advantage of the reset we're seeing. The need for regeneration along better lines, implicitly cleaner, healthier and greener, also creating jobs and encouraging growth. And it's looking to green finance to help make this happen. So I suggest it's much, much more than just a temporary fad. And at the root of it all, it's a technical revolution and investors who want to be involved in financing that revolution, which I'll come to shortly. Firstly, what do I mean by green finance? It's very simple, as simple as this. It's normal finance, by a loan or a bond or a mortgage or a car loan or a share raising, which has a specific, verifiable environmental purpose at its heart. I'll repeat that. A very straightforward mortgage or green car loan, which has that verifiable green environmental purpose at its heart. And the verification is a very important part of that process. The idea is that that will lead to lower cost because it's a better credit for the bank or the lender or the investor. So with that verifiable, independently assessed purpose, your mortgage can qualify as green and potentially attract a lower interest rate because the risk for the bank or the investor is better. And driving much of this is technology, as you might expect, because what we can say is that this is a technical story because the climate crisis is a technical failure. As many countries, especially in Asia, not just China, have grown rapidly post-war, and especially in the past 50 to 60 years, so clean energy has failed to keep up with those ambitions. Except in a very few countries, nuclear power, nuclear power has failed to deliver and renewables have only recently come on the scene. In fact, the only viable energy source around the globe has been fossil until very recently. And we have all benefited economically from that. So fossil fuel energy sources have doubled since 1980 in just 40 years, which makes the technology of renewables and their potential very interesting, already showing growth patterns identical to those from previous, um, from previous uh, in earlier product revolutions, new energy technologies are now seen to be superior to the old, superior to fossil fuel. Even without the, without the idea of a climate crisis, one can argue that markets will be driving the rapid expansion of these technologies and pushing down prices at the same time. It's already happening. Solar, with wind, with battery, and that's coming. Hydrogen, possibly, against fossil fuel and carbon intensive technologies.
Typically, product revolutions need a 30-year incubation period, followed by a 30-year period of disruption, followed by another 30 years of stabilization. The first 30 years of the incubation see the technology developed somewhat below the radar until the right costs or efficiency levels are reached. This incubation period is followed by a period of exploding volumes, unit price declines, and soaring profits for the new monopolies. This was the case with IT, with chips and with processors, with mass production technology, the very first wave of electrification, even cars and steam engines followed a very similar timeline. Then there is often a period of stabilization, which sees greatly increased regulation to make sure that gains are passed on to customers and the traditional excesses of capitalist innovation are tempered and taxed. I suggest we are just entering the third period with IT. With renewable energy, we are approaching that second phase of disruption with the usual business and political challenges that that encompasses. The key is this for a financial investor. Buying into better technologies on a falling cost curve and leading the way in embedding those factors in your, your business model has always been a driver of long-term advantage. This is at the root of interest in green bonds, in sustainability linked loans, in ESG, and so on. And now you will note already that the jargon of this green finance has begun to sprout, as it so often does in financial markets, a sure sign of great interest. Here are some examples of different technology diffusions following very similar paths, albeit with a slightly different, uh, slightly different curves at different places, but very much uh, showing the same sort of story as I mentioned, the 30-30-30. Energy transition, you can say, is the technology revolution in just the same way. Due to historical accidents, accidents we can say it's just 30 years later to rival, largely the anti-nuclear lobby, but other factors have played into this as well. So here we see where, in terms of volume use, in terms of production, this is where the uh, energy is, revolution is coming from. And in some 20 years, probably around 2040, 2050, we will see a very different energy world altogether. Revolutions normally start with a kind of killer application. And when that potential of that new technology is obvious, but not yet ready, that's when the investment starts. You can see that exactly in the IBM personal computer, the Tesla Model S, and indeed in the old Carnegie Steelworks from 1875. Very interesting in a similar story. You can say that the investors are asking two very basic questions. How does my investment impact climate change? And how does climate change impact my investments? And it's very, very noteworthy to see the number of signatories to the United Nations um, PRI, the, the Principles of Responsible Investment, signatory growth has already grown considerably since this time and represents trillions and trillions of, of, of dollars with 2,250 signatories assets well over $85 trillion looking in this space, the right kind of investment. They too want to profit from the coming energy, green energy disruption. And uh, this is exactly the same curve as we saw earlier, focusing on both the oil and sun, uh, sorry, oil and gas energy consumption versus tons of oil equivalent on the other side. New technology, of course, it needs subsidies. It needs idealists in the early days, which is what we've had with wind and with, indeed with Solar, and well, I'll come on to that a bit more in a moment. Uh, it improves as more users join the experimentation and learning process, and eventually you reach that tipping curve, which we expect to be around 2030, when we will really see acceleration of renewable as a cost and efficiency factor versus the um, versus the green. Solar energy itself is, of course, a fascinating subject to see how it's how it's been working, particularly how the prices have come down as a percentage of total, and as this simple graph shows. Um, against the total of percentage of total worldwide energy consumption on the on the far uh, right hand column, it's really taken off uh, around the world. Electrification, of course, is much more than just electricity. It's a massive investment in new technology to change systems. There's a huge amount of applications which will come both in industry, into construction, manufacturing, and in mining, which will eventually replace the dirty coal that we have. I'll leave this slide up for a little bit to stimulate your imagination as to all the other areas that electrification can affect our daily lives. I think it's worth commenting that no one understands this overall situation better than China. China has been the world's largest manufacturer of solar panels since 2008, 
and since 2011 has produced the majority of global photovoltaics on an annualized basis. It's estimated that by the end of 2017, China had enough manufacturing capacity to produce 51 gigawatts of PV modules per year, an amount over twice as large as 2010's global production of 24 gigawatts. Either way, they are a leader in wind turbines too. They're not alone, of course. And the UK is well represented in both research and development, uh, and, and indeed in leading the way in certain of the new renewables. I can only encourage the government to invest more, particularly in science and technology. We also see significant investment in hydrogen energy investment in, in the UK, in Japan and Germany and elsewhere, with many other countries now investing heavily in these renewable technologies. Perhaps the main point is this, that the environment movement has moved crucially from environmentalists to business and commerce and investors and finance, which is where we come in. And the race, as we like to call it, is on. Incidentally, in 2014, the International Energy Authority forecast that average solar prices would reach five cents per kilowatt in by 2050, 36 later, years later. In fact, it only took six years to get there. In 2016, just five years ago, analysts forecast that internal combustion cars would account for 60 percent of cars sold in the 2050s. But on current trajectories and analysis of battery costs, great analysis by Carnegie Mellon, by 2025, vehicles will beat internal combustion on price and other key purchase criteria by 2025. In fact, a fraction with a fraction of the maintenance costs, better acceleration, near equal range. It's hard to imagine that internal combustion cars, cars will be sold in anything by very niche markets away by the 2030s. The betting is that these same market dynamics will play out in other sectors. Favorable regulatory and policy backdrops leading to innovation, early adoption, investment cycles speeding up, enabling performance improvement and cost declines much faster than predicted, leading to greater investment and solutions reaching market tipping points where they beat incumbents on costs, on quality, on regulatory alignment, and on, importantly, social acceptance. One key area I would like to mention where green finance is set to make a difference is in addressing biodiversity loss. And how interesting to be reminded just how active the Duke of Edinburgh was in conservation and climate change long, long before it was fashionable to do so. In the UK, the government has just published a review of the economics of biodiversity loss led by Professor Partha Das Gupta of Cambridge University, which sets out a framework for an economics that points out that we and our economies are embedded in the biosphere. This is about understanding biodiversity loss as an asset management challenge, because nature is an asset on which our economies, our livelihoods and our well-being all ultimately rely. We know this. Yet we strongly uh, and seriously mismanage this asset globally to the extent that our demands on nature far exceed its capacity on a long-term sustainable basis. Over-extraction and pollution are depleting stocks of natural capital in quality, in quantity, or both, and this affects the abiotic environment. We know this. So by changing how we apply risk measurement to recognize that our economies are embedded within nature, not external to it, that there is a cost to every fish we catch, every tree we chop down, we can take a different path where man's involvement with nature is truly sustainable. And finance for this is crucial. A trade that cannot be financed tends to dry up, whether it's palm oil or coal. Biodiversity loss risk is clear, but its financial effects are much harder to measure and invest against than carbon alone. A lot of the work that we are doing now in the Green Finance Institute is exactly to try and work out where those risks are and how we apply finance to them. In short, nature needs to enter economic and finance decision making in the same way that energy, buildings, cars, machines and skills do. But here are some examples of what we could call biodiversity bonds. A lovely, a lovely bond, one of my favourites, the Green Bond by Anglian Water, uh, undertaken in 2017 um, for £250 million. The proceeds went for new water resources, improved efficiency and connectivity of that network, flood defences at vulnerable sites, and to reduce carbon footprint and increase the amount of renewable energy that they generate. 
This ha had an impact of improved efficiency. Same amount of water used into supply today as 30 years ago, despite a 30% increase in the population. And it had some wonderful projects attached to it, such as this wetland treatment site for the nitrifying sand at in Ingoldsthorpe, Norfolk. <sighs> impact, reduced operational costs, enhanced and protected biodiversity. Here's another of my favourites. Uh, <laughs> Blue Bond by the Nordic Investment Bank. The Baltic Sea region, as you may well know, is home of nine countries, 90 million people. The Baltic Sea is one of the most threatened uh, eco-marine systems. This was a bond undertaken in 2019 for 2 billion Swedish krona, which is approximately 200 million pounds, um, with a five-year tenor to it. The proceeds went toward wastewater treatment, prevention of water pollution, and water-related climate change adaptation, um, which meant cleaner, bluer seas around the Baltics, which was had the express design of improving tourism. Uh, some would say sales of Lithuanian vodka will hopefully will go up too. Improved quality of surface and groundwater with positive effects on marine life. One of the main beneficiaries of this, of beneficiaries of this was the, the newest Slusen at, uh, in Stockholm in Sweden, which saw, uh, saw great uh, redevelopment of the area and also a flood mitigation system. And just to show that it's not all just about uh, biodiversity, but it can be useful, extremely useful for social housing as well. The Nederlands, our Vatterschaps Bank, made an affordable housing social bonds. This is to stimulate your interest in uh, green finance, of course, which covers this purpose, purpose led bonds too. Um, settlement in 2017, a seven year deal for $2 billion. In fact, this NWB has issued seven social bonds so far with an extraordinary impact, 25% almost reduction in evictions, um, two and a half million households benefited from sub-market rents and stable market housing conditions, um, and uh, a great investment in energy improvements. With the benefits very clearly coming through in lower crime, better health, improved education, employment, and of course the value of house prices improving in those areas. Green finance at its heart, like all finance, is about risk and reward. If we can identify a real risk because of climate change or biodiversity loss, there will be a way of measuring it. It may be an upside, it may be a downside, but then we can create an investment to meet that risk or take advantage of it. So the work we're doing at the Green Finance Institute, very much supported by the city, is identify identifying better both physical and transition work So physical and transition risk, and then work out how to move more capital into the solution. It's about better building insulation, about home heating, about electrical vehicles, shipping, fuel, and so on. On the risk measurement side, the Bank of England is strongly involved in this work, not least through the NGFS, the network of central banks looking at greening the financial system, which is doing great work. Clearly, much of the current attention is being given to the downside risk in existing carbon intensive industries. But there is also a clear upside for companies that have already moved to reduce their carbon output and adjusted their business model for the new energy tech, as I mentioned earlier. And politicians also get the point today in a way they have not done before. If you want the youth a vote in the UK to get those socially concerned teenagers on your side, you'd better have a good environment story to tell to support those aspirations. Yes, that slightly controversial Swede, Greta Thunberg, has captured the Jugend Zeitgeist of our time in her searching questions and politicians the world over have noticed. Where well, environment, climate change, destruction of nature has become some of the most one of the most serious issues out there. It's very clear, young people think climate change and the destruction of nature is the most critical aspect of society. Would you be willing to change your lifestyle to protect nature and the environment? The clear answer is yes, we would. However, if this is a global challenge, the solutions will be largely local. The energy market is not the same country to country. And, and, and nor is the home mortgage market, for instance. What works for Fannie Mae in the United States financing over $100 billion now of green mortgages for greener multifamily apartment blocks in the US doesn't necessarily work in the UK. 
but it hasn't so far. I must also add that the work on environmental concern about climate stress, biodiversity loss is not new. Let's thank many previous generations, including the Duke of Edinburgh. Many people working in this space for 30 years who have been laying the groundwork for what we are doing now. For us in the UK, Paris 2015 was a game changer as we took on our legal commitments and decided to make finance a central part of our response. This is reinforced when Prime Minister Theresa May committed to the UK to net zero carbon by 2050. A great move, if I may say, by her. Lastly, what can we expect from COP26 later this year? Hosted by the UK with Italy and taking place in Bonnie Glasgow in Scotland, where it promises the sun will shine uh, even in November. The ambition is currently under construction, as they say, so my comments are not official. However, I hope very much that this will be the pathway to net zero COP when countries will be persuaded to commit to net zero carbon production by a certain date, possibly as far out as 2050, 2060, thereby meeting or moving quickly towards their Paris commitments with greater certainty and greater force. What does that mean above all for markets and for us here in the green city of London? I come back to tech. Watch out for those investment opportunities. And thank you very much for listening. Thank, thank you so much, um, Sir Roger. I, I have to say that it's really good that um, this presentation is being recorded because I just think there's so much information in there um, that people are going to need to go back and, and listen to it again um, because there is just so much there to consider. Um, I've, I've learnt over, I don't know, over recent years, this thing about risk and reward through the finance sector. Um, and, and I've also been doing quite a lot of work on strategy and going back to the World Economic Forum papers where this year climate change and biodiversity were there with the, the highest risk factors. So really significant, as you say. Um, so we'll go on to some questions um, and I'm going to take advantage of being the moderator to ask you one of my questions first. Um, and so you talked about the production of palm oil. Palm oil. So the, the systems involved in the production of substances like palm oil affect communities, biodiversity, ecosystem services. So would you say that um, their complexity demands the use of multidisciplinary teams, including representation from the finance sector? Uh, almost certainly, yes. There's an interesting discussion about whether the, so far the kind of the carbon uh, revolution has been primarily a debt financing revolution and how do we tackle biodiversity? And there was a very good question in the Q&A about biodiversity early on, because um, biodiversity for many of us is so much, so important, but it's so hard to measure the metrics that are there and put some kind of financial wrap around that such you can design an investment which then meets the risk that is posed by that particular, um, by that particular aspect of biodiversity. And every single one of those products, probably 16, 17, 18 different products in biodiversity, each need their own metrics and their own measurement system to make them to make them really worthwhile and valuable in order to design the product that will then help to get rid of it. Um, I had a very interesting discussion this morning with, uh, with a major water utility uh, who I think have every opportunity to 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 make a to make a um, <coughs> to make a a virtue out of creating a whole series of biodiverse wetland um, um, uh, wetland wetland sites at the same time as they actually renew and help to get their water supply uh, chain better and stop the leakage and all the rest of it. And I think that kind of combination of practical requirement for better water systems versus mm -hmm. creating wetlands is, is one of those things you can do. Palm oil is really difficult. And in fact, anything which deals specifically with countries a long way away is harder. I think we're doing fantastic work in the West. I think it is really accelerating. Talk to India, talk to China, talk to Indonesia. Mm -hmm. You don't get the same buy-in. 
no no it's it's been interesting hasn't it sort of um you work through the systems approach and and that's difficult to try and get to the right answers um and i think um ecosystem services has has definitely helped in trying to make people appreciate the value of what is there um but it is fraught with difficulties in trying to measure as you say yes it is but we're going to do it we're yeah. going to do it because we know how important it is and because of things like the Dutch Gupta Review, which specifically talk about the economics of individual assets. Now, we haven't, sought, we haven't solved this yet, but yeah. I, I do think we're getting there. Yeah, so I come back to the thing of, you know, actually, we've been doing green finance in the UK for decades and decades. We just haven't labelled it green. We've yeah. been doing, yeah. whether it's wind farm financing or solar farm, we're doing lots and lots of it. But it's been a very much a debt story. Yeah. And I, th I yeah. think there's a very strong reputational damage story to be had around um, biodiversity loss because so many processes, if they can be shown to be wrong, that will directly affect the company that is, um, that is, that is uh, doing the wrong thing. It was very noticeable that certain very large plastic manufacturers came out with a new policy very soon after the Attenborough film about oh, the, the, the blue oceans, about the dolphins choking on bits yeah, of plastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Companies that are aware of their, share, their shareholders and aware of their reputation, they don't want that to suffer. Yeah. And and as you say, it just keeps coming back to risk and reward all the time, doesn't it? it yeah, interesting. Yeah, and, and, and of course, it, it, I, I, can I just mention, it, it, yeah, it isn't yeah. just risk and reward because we've also seen, as, as the Lord Mayor would know much better than I, we've also <laughs> seen this amazing transformation from finance being the ultimate goal of everything we do towards yeah. social purpose becoming much more the, the end of what we do yeah. and this has been a revolution just in the last four or five years companies must have social purpose they must have a meaning yeah. they must have a have a real role to play and and it's it's not completely widespread yet but it's there's a very strong trend in that direction thanks um there's a question here uh we only have until 2050 to be carbon neutral, ideally even earlier than that. Um, how can these cycles that usually need 30 plus 30 plus 30 be accelerated? And what's the role for government, industry and citizens? Very good question. Very good question. I hope we're well into the first 30 years. I think we're well into the second 30 years actually. Um, and yeah. of course, the role of so many bodies, uh, both in government and outside, and I think like the Green Finance Institute, is about helping to accelerate that change. And we're all desperate to do it. But you're faced with the inevitable reality. You know, you plan a new cement factory, it takes five years to plan, five years to build. If you've mm. designed it from the very beginning with carbon as its main source of fuel, then 10 years later, you've still got a carbon steel factory. Um, and, and that's why the, the research and development side is so important, so that we can build that in to the new modeling that we're doing right now. And, and indeed, there's a lot happening in steel and in cement and in shipping fuel and all the others. It just takes time to get the technology right and to get it even yeah. vaguely commercial. Yeah. yeah we, can, we, are, we are working to accelerate. Yeah, I can remember going back to uh, the late 80s, early 90s, where people were researching all sorts of different types of technology. And as you say, sort of trying to get those right then and and here we are sort of 30 years later so definitely in that second 30 years as you say so yeah moving moving yes. forward from that. um and, so, and, you, and you've got and you've got to be an optimist because we've got to invest you have yeah and if we're going to invest yeah. in one thing or another then let's go for it yeah absolutely um so another question for you um so london is leading the world in green finance what systems are in place to nurture other cities and share the learning to advance progress in green finance and will those become mainstream actually i think we're I, we love to say we're leading in everything <laughs> you name it <laughs> london's leading in it um i i do think we've done some brilliant work in green finance i really do and i think we've done enormous amount of work on taxonomies and on regulation and on what it means to be green and what, how to measure risk inside the system yeah. and i'd say the bank of england was a leader in measuring risk, climate risk inside a system, both both physical risk and political risk as things change. Yeah, They've been yeah. fantastic. But there are many countries, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, working for a, 
the Swedish organization, I have to say, they're ahead of us. And the Dutch are amazingly far advanced. And there are other countries which are doing really extremely well in terms of what they actually do with their with their power systems. The, 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 one, the one enigma for many of us is uh, China, which clearly <coughs> has a huge interest in, uh, in green energy, and yet is still building, and will be till mm. 2030, still building coal mm. power fire stations. And that's a sort of very hard to reconcile in a way, because, because why do, it, it's, it's as though they don't, slightly don't believe their own philosophy of solar and wind, because they're still building coal fire, because yeah. it's easier. And that's, um, but I would say, <coughs> as a, excuse me, uh, there's, a, there's a very good network of green financial centers around the world. There's a lot of information sharing. It's not competitive, really. Uh, it's about sharing ideas and putting new, new, new good ideas into practice. It's one, it's one of the things that's be, become more apparent to me. And um, as we've worked on these, uh, these green city briefings, and we're sort of getting expertise from around the world from various different cities. Um, and I probably know less about the, the green finance, but some of the other aspects are really interesting and it will be really good to be able to share practice across the green city briefings, I think, because there are some real nice pieces of work that are, that are out there. Um, and China, China, I find a bit difficult on a personal basis because I, I first went to China with work about 20 years ago. I was so surprised by how much they had progressed in making their buildings green. And yet, on the other hand, you can see, as you say, um, that you, you still get so much use of fossil fuel and new um, new industries being built on fossil fuels, so a real mix in China, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yes, they are. They are. They are also one of the greatest exponents of green finance as a as a as a tool and as a, as a language. So they're very. Oh, they've okay. espoused all of that uh, into their into their p diplomatic, their political language, all the way to the very top. President Xi talks about green finance as being a tremendous thing to do. Yeah. So they're they're certainly talking the right talk. Um. So um. Let's look at the next one. Um. As stated, new tech maturity can be out to sixty years. Um. Why does finance ignore integrating proven technologies we have today that once systematized can create exponential improvement? Yes, Chris, I'm not quite sure I agree with you. Uh, I, I might want to have done five years ago, but I'm not quite sure I think that that's the case today. Um, any, any major company that is not taking into account the technology, the, the advantage of better, cheaper, more potential uh, in, in their energy structure is simply missing the point. And I know, I know, I know, I cover UK corporates. I know many companies who are extremely active in this space. So I, I think that's maybe a, a, just a slightly old-fashioned point of view. Um, the, the time scale as well, which, which other, others have commented on, 35, 30, 60 years, of course, we're trying to accelerate that and bring it much, much further forward. Um, it will be done through better tech. It's so important our government invest in tech and in science and research because that is what will really create the difference. And they're doing great things in many areas. And I'm not saying they're not. But to say that the to say that the um the finance is ignoring proven technologies, uh once systematized can create an exponential involvement against the multiple against the multiple challenges associated with climate change. I I'm I'd, I'd take issue with that. Yeah. Okay. Um then moving on, a, a reminder about the, the value of the ocean, and we should not be forgetting um, the ocean's ro role in the whole of climate change. Um, and then going on to the next one, how can we integrate polluter pays principle, um, which would make many schemes more sustainable? Hmm. How do you put the bell around the cat's neck? <laughs> um, slightly, I mean, <clears throat> 
Blue to pays is would work, I think, quite well. In fact, already does work well yeah, in some does, yeah. Western countries. Yeah. Um, you persuade an Indian or a Chinese or an Indonesian or an African nation to transfer straight away to blue to pays. One, just one of those difficult things to do. So yeah. it's it's I I often I often feel actually that we we're slightly self congratulatory about what we're doing in green finance in the UK. We're, we're, we're very proud of what we've done. And we're, we are very keen on our tech development. The problem isn't here. Yeah. The problems of, 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 climate, of climate warming are primarily on the other side of the world. And that's where our big institutions, our United Nations, our UNEP, our COP26 are so important because it's about bringing people around into the right headspace. But it's, it's not easy. Yeah. This is global politics. It's money. It's it's all those other things that we need need to work with rather than against in order to, to see change. Yeah, and uh, I mean it. It also is an endpoint, is it? Because you, when you look at the whole life cycle costs of anything, um, and you need to pick up each of those as you're going along along the way. So yeah, understand. Um, so I think we might have got through the questions. Let me just check. Oh, um, if we can measure carbon capture in plant processes and soil regeneration, along with our ability to measure carbon release in the human processes of consumption itself, why can't we, through a relational analysis, create a model that connects our financial accountability to this relation? I have to think about that one. It's quite complex, oh, uh, but I think it's a, it's a jolly nice idea, a jolly good idea. Um, if we can measure carbon capture in plant processes in origin, along with our ability to measure carbon release in the human process of consumption itself, why can't we, through a rational relational analysis, create a model that converts, connects up with our financial accountability to this relation? Um, Good question. Let's try it out. <laughs> Let's see what happens. I'm trying to think at the top of my head what that would look like in terms of any kind of yeah. financing financing model or financing system or financing um, strategy. Yeah. Um, As I was reading, thank you, Turf Systems. I was trying to work it out at the same time, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So um, I think we've got to the end of our questions. And very good timing that is as well. Well, I hope this was okay, um, um, Master, simply because it's, it's very much, I think, the background to what will make us a greener, greener city is the interest yeah. of the financial community. And I do think finance is eventually going to drive this. And the next big area to get excited about is biodiversity. I'm not saying yeah. climate has been solved, but climate and investment in climate technology is going apace. Yeah. How long before batteries? How long before hydrogen? How long before ammonia for ships? I don't know, but it's huge investment going in there. Yeah. Biodiversity, we need to work on very hard from here. And and it's become more and critical very fast, isn't it? I think. By yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, much thank you. It's been absolutely fascinating. And I am going to go back and watch this again. Um, so, Thank you so much. I can't tell you how great you are to both yourself and the Lord Mayor. Fascinating session today. I'm going to have to order it, so thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Sir Roger, for a very absorbing conversation. And thank you all to, for attending this first session. Um, I hope you found it interesting uh, and that it has stimulated your ambition to make a difference. Many ways that were described as the impact that we can have and many questions raised. We will send out a short survey to gather your opinions of this first session and I'd be very pleased to receive your feedback. Thank you very much in advance. This series of briefings is one of the activities in the AIPH Green City Initiative. We lead global thinking on the successful integration of nature into the built environment. Using knowledge exchange, advocacy and networking, 
um, our AIPH activities and events motivate the value of plants in providing solutions for common city problems. Some questions were raised today, some of the solutions will be described in future briefings. We strive to create an enabling environment to shape and nurture a strategic shift in city governance and planning. And we hope to further this through these briefings. We work to position horticulture, the living green, in all conversations that influence city form and function. And through green finance, we've been given some hints as to where we might have some impact in this. Our annual Green City Conference is coming up on the 22nd of April. In this virtual conference, we hear from the champions of green cities. These are people who shape the future of our cities with their energy and their expertise. We're also launching the inaugural World Green City Awards at this conference. These celebrate the commitment, innovation and achievement of city leaders around the world. To find out more, register for the AIPH Green City Conference. The link is in the chat and registration is free. I hope to see you there. Again, thank you very much for joining the session today. I look forward to welcoming you again to the second session in May, at which we hear about nature-based solutions for water attenuation. Our speakers for the second session are Robert Breers, author of major reference works on blue-green infrastructure, and Prof. James Hitchmore, Professor of Horticultural Ecology at the University of Sheffield. Until then, thank you and farewell.